supply chain. People who live in the shadows of these plants have a 10 year less life expectancy of the average American because by where they live and they live in the chemical corridor as we call it, Kansas Alley. At the end of the day, the climate crisis as we term it is a result of white supremacy, colonialism, imperialism, and capitalism. And so any solution that is not resisting and addressing the systems of oppression is not a solution. I think we all agree that we really need to transition away from this polluting industry, but we don't want to leave workers behind. But we can also put oil and gas workers um, back to work in plugging old and abandoned wells, which is a, a huge challenge many states are dealing with now. We need to look at ways to have a diversified, stable economy that circulates the dollars in the local community more. We need a cultural shift. We got one on smoking, and the amount of people smoking now has been severely reduced. We need a cultural shift on plastic. We've done this before in America, and globally, we can do it again. The number one thing is to educate and spread awareness. And sometimes that doesn't feel very proactive because you don't feel like you're directly doing something, but it plants seeds that will spread very quickly and eventually will blossom into organized collective actions. I get hope knowing there's this bigger picture out there that sees the connection between the fracking and these petrochemical manufacturers and the consumerism and the recycling. Everybody can be part of this movement and we want everybody to be part of this movement. Find common ground. Talk to everyone. Because you never know who can be an ally. We articulate in our lens of work the intersections of poverty, of climate, of democracy, of systemic racism. All of that is linked and it forms a vicious nexus which we see manifest in different ways uh, in different communities. But the key is that the solution is that cohesive narrative. Recognizing these issues are interlinked, we are interlinked, and our response must be so. The change must be systemic. I just Premium feel that so much in my heart that the work that we're doing here is beautiful, beautiful work. We're talking about how to change uh, our society in a fundamental way. There's power, you know, on this call, power in these circles. Welcome, everyone, and thanks for joining. I if I can go to the next slide. There we go. Um, we just want to take a quick second before we dive into things and thank all our co-sponsors of the A to Z digital series um, for helping to get the word out on these awesome uh, interactive spaces. And you can also let us know if you want to co-sponsor um, any future events in the chat. So just wanted to take a minute to acknowledge everyone that's helped make this space what it is. So welcome to debriefing our climate grief. Uh, before we get into the actual programming, we're gonna do a little bit of Zoom housekeeping really quickly. We do have a packed agenda tonight, um, but wanted to make sure that everyone is able to fully interact with us uh, as much as possible. So on the left, you can see that you have your microphone. Um, please keep yourself muted. Everyone should have been muted upon entry. Um, so that we can make sure that everyone can clearly hear our speakers. Uh, we are recording and live streaming just a portion of this program tonight. So uh, after Bailey is done speaking, we will stop recording and stop live streaming to make sure that um, you know everyone feels comfortable in this space. So feel free to be on or off camera during that time. Um, but we welcome you if you feel comfortable to be on camera um, and, and be a little closer to being in space together with us in that way. Uh, we're definitely going to try to make it as interactive as possible. We would love to hear from y'all. So 
I just want to point out where the chat feature is. So I see some of you all um, from all over joining us uh, and introducing yourselves in the chat. So thanks for being here. Um, again, just wanted to say that we'll be using the chat, monitoring the chat, so feel free to drop questions in there uh, and also enter stack, which we will talk about really quickly, but um, just wanted to have a reminder to please engage with kindness. Uh, racism, misogyny, xenophobia, and hate will not be tolerated. Um, but to interact more, please feel free to drop some plus signs in there if something resonates with you, some exclamation points to welcome our speakers um, or show some excitement around what we're talking about. Uh, and like I said, Stack is what we'll be using. There'll be a Q&A portion. Um, and we also just want to hear from you all. So uh, what Stack is, is using a list of speakers who want to offer comments. So please feel free to just write Stack uh, into the chat box if there is um, something that you'd like to come off view and offer uh, into the space. Um, just also wanted to note that sometimes you hear the words progressive Stack used, and that's specifically using Stack in a way um, to ensure that voices that are often submerged, discounted, or excluded from traditional discussions and make sure that they're heard. So that is my portion of housekeeping, and I will turn it over to, I think, BJ to introduce and offer a land acknowledgement. Okay, yeah. Um, thank you very much. I want to thank everyone for coming tonight and <laughs> sharing some of their time with us. And I'm going to turn this down because Ian is uh, we're 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 watching some floor votes, and I do apologize. Um, and they're blowing up my signal, so I'm gonna shut this off. Pardon me. Um, okay, I, I introduce myself. I am BJ McManama. I am a, um, a wife, a mom, a grandma, a sister, an auntie, a friend, um, and I call Appalachia my home. It's been my home for probably half my life or more. I was born and raised in the southern tier of so-called New York State in my ancestors' homelands, the Seneca. Um, I've lived all of up and down the center of the great Appalachian Valley. Um, I came to West Virginia when I was very young and about halfway through, we moved down to the Great Smoky Mountains and then I'm back here where I feel at home, where my children were born and raised, where I'm helping to raise my grandchildren. And so what we're doing in these series, in this educational outreach that we're doing is um, is really close to my heart. It's because we are, if you have been paying attention to uh, what's been happening with Senator Manchin, our West Virginia Senator, um, trying to pass permit reform and just absolutely trump, tramp over our rights and threaten our peace and our safety and our tranquility in these beautiful mountains. So, um, and I am an organizer. I've been an organizer with the Indigenous Environmental Network for several years. I've been with them, working with them for almost 18 years now on a whole host of different, um, different issues uh, up and down this hemisphere here in the global north and in the global south. And I'm honored and humbled to be part of what we have done with the A to Z impacts of plastic for shoot, almost three years now. It doesn't seem possible. So I'm here to make a land acknowledgement. Um, and if you haven't already done it, you can put your name back in the chat. And if you know the original peoples um, where you live now, you can enter it. I think we also have a map. We can put up a link if you don't know. And it's, it's good that we do this, that we remember the original peoples, um, but we also need to know what this land meant to them, meant to us now too, because part of our indigenous culture, all of our indigenous culture is grounded in the land because that's where we come from and that's where we return. This is where we have we have find everything we had our 
shelter, our food, our medicines, our ceremonies, and our ancestors went back to the earth. And this is, you know, this is, it, it means everything. I mean, it's hard to put it into words, right? And so everyone, it's good that you know who was here before, but learn what they learned, relearn what they learned, know how they survived and how we, if we can get back to where we need to be, how we can also thrive and survive and go forward respecting the land, respecting the gifts. These are gifts. <laughs> you know, we don't have to pay for, we never had to pay for the woods, the lands, the prairies, the grasslands were our grocery store. <laughs> they were our Walmart, if you want to think of it that way. It's where our, our food, our clothing, our shelter, and you know, our enjoyment came from. So, um, I just want to remind people that we can't buy our way out of where we're at right now. We can't fix what's wrong using the system that got us here. So as we're like tonight, it's, all, it's about healing and it's about debriefing our, our anxiety, our stress, our sadness <laughs> about what's what's happening around us. And, you know, I, I announced earlier uh, when, before everybody came in that we have defeated uh, Joe Manchin's permit reform one more time. This is the third time. So we're three for zero, yay. <laughs> and it, the reason we're doing that is because the destruction and the violence that is taking place here in this sacrifice zone in Appalachia and the Permian Basin, up in the bacon um, and more to come, um, you know, we have to fight to stop it because that's where a lot of our anxiety and our stress is coming from because our homes, our land means for most people just as much as it did the people that were here before. So we can almost imagine, probably not quite, um, how they felt when the Europeans came, when the invaders came, when they didn't respect the land and they didn't respect, respect the gifts and they just kind of run roughshod over everything. So healing is good and we need to heal and we need to recognize how to do this, to regain our strength, to sustain our strength so that we can fight. And I know everybody hates that word, but it is a fight. It is a fight for our future. It's a fight for our grandchildren and our great grandchildren. And I'm sorry, I never plan on this. Of course I don't, but I get real emotional because, and I, and I don't think I'm any different than anyone else um, when our peace is threatened and our safety is threatened. And we have people, you know, who are facing much, much more violence than some of us. So um, anyway, I just wanna thank everyone. Thank you for acknowledging where you're at, who was there before, learn so that we can protect, we can renew as much as possible and that we can resist and we can hold the people who are doing this, the hold those responsible accountable because it isn't all on us. I will admit, we're gonna have to sacrifice some. We're gonna have to learn how to do things differently. But tonight, transitioning back, I think you'll find a lot of value and you'll find things that you can take with you. And we're here. Our emails are at the end. We have a slide, I do believe. And most of us are available and we're here to help. We're here to come together because we can't do it alone. So with that, I will end because we have a, a lot to talk about. Uh, and it isn't about me. <laughs> so, and I also want to thank everyone that put this together tonight. I had very little to do with it because of other obligations, but I will say that the people who have done this for almost three years are some of the best people. They're dedicated, they're lovely, caring, special people, and I want to thank them too. So everyone, um, 
without any further ado, as they say, I'm going to pass this back off to Emily. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, BJ. Uh, next up, I believe we're going to Mary. Good evening, everyone. So thankful uh, that you're here and so thankful that for BJ. Um, you have been our grounding force from from the beginning. And um, it's just it just it's just such a, a comfort um, to every time I hear your voice and, and share space with you. So I appreciate you and thank you. Um, so uh, first, uh, before we start kind of uh, talking about why we're here tonight, we, we just want to acknowledge this, um, the historical harm that many communities have suffered and had to confront um, the challenges, the aggression, the violence as they speak their truth uh, to power in the United States and worldwide. Um, we understand that the grief and exhaustion uh, is not new for many communities, um, and they've been fighting um, extraction, environmental degradation for hundreds of years. Um, so what we're trying to do tonight um, is really just acknowledge uh, our, our grief in a way that allows us to process it and, and, and use it in, to, to, um, to motivate us and give us hope and, and um, and kind of direct uh, the action that comes comes from from the 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 sadness and the grief, the suffering. Um, you know, there, there's historical harm and and recent gatherings that we've had in Port Arthur, Texas. Um, recently, the Break Free from Plastic movement met um, petrochemical um, people from the impacted communities and the organizations that support them met. Um, and we saw firsthand the, um, the people that live in Port Arthur, Texas have a 20 to uh, 30 year less life expectancy. Um, also, uh, I believe it was climate reality they met in Houston and also, um, you know, was, they were able to, to see firsthand. But the, in every, there's many, many communities across the country that are, are suffering those same harms. Um, and we just want to name that while we're we're doing work around extraction of the earth's resources it's it's a very extractive uh, process on us as well and and we need to find ways of of just coming together and supporting us so that we can you know continue this work and continue to to um to just help each other build this community of care that that is the answer. It's the only way that, like like BJ said, you know, we can't buy our way out of this. We have to create connections and a community of care that will support um, the values that that will not um, keep keep these harms to the earth keep coming. And then just bring awareness, you know, just bring awareness about what grief grief is, what climate grief and and ecological grief is and that and name it and and let's just um you know not let it consume us so that we can keep moving forward so uh with that i will pass it over to to bailey oh i'm sorry if if um if you wanted to share so we're gonna um we're going to share this slide deck that we're using tonight um if you have access to a computer and you want to put what brought you here tonight and share with us, we'd love to know. Um, so you can put it in the slide deck that we're gonna share. And if not, just put it in the chat as well. And we'd just love to, to know from you, like what, what drew you here? What, what, you know, what said, hey, I'm gonna show, show up there tonight. And we'd love to know so that it would kind of inform the work going forward so that, you know, we can maybe do some more of this type of work if, if it's needed. So we'll we'll put the the slide there. So I put it 
putting the slide deck in the in the chat. And if you you'd rather put it in, just put it in the chat. That that's fine too. Hi everyone, this is Josephine, one of the co-hosts. I'm gonna read some of these out for you all. So I see, I'm here to connect with others experiencing climate grief. I'm here for concern about proposed plastics plants along the Ohio River. Um, here to connect with others on how to keep fighting through the constant drumbeat of bad news and help others in my group. Uh, desire for community and hope amidst difficult work. To continue to build community, our power to create a just transition. I find myself fluctuating between grief and despair and becoming more of a misanthrope each day. I feel that one. Um, and uh, here because my organization is starting to do more work with petrochemicals and I want to find ways to support our mental health as we deepen this work. I see Rokaya, you have your hand raised. Yes, I can't figure out how to put it in, but we are here because we want to save the three Bs, babies, butterflies, and bees. That is an innate law. And because we have been ignoring innate laws for the last 60 years now, look at where we are. Innate laws is what was put here so that we as human beings can live in harmony with the rest of creation. And this is not being taught anymore. One of those innate laws is the three bees, babies, butterflies, and bees. Without them, mankind has no future. So I'm talking about all the pollinators and pollinators are throughout all of our ecosystem and we need them. And our babies are our future, and we're killing their future. That's why the musketeers are here. I brought a group with me, and I'm so glad to see that they have showed up. There should be more, but we shall see who can make it tonight. But we're here to support this all the way. Thank love you, you, Mary. I love you too, Rakaya. Thank you. All right, are we ready to transition? Maybe. We... Yeah. How do I sound? Good. Okay, beautiful. All right, well, thank you all so much for sharing what brought you into this collective space this afternoon or evening, I suppose. Um, we want to start 
with a short moment for grounding. Know that you're welcome to participate as little or as much as makes sense for you tonight and that there's no right or wrong way to do this. Um, my recommendation is that if you're able to or feel comfortable that you turn off your camera just so that you have more freedom and space to turn inward for our kind of meditative practice together to kick off our conversation. And as we settle in, maybe take the slowest, softest breath you've taken all day. Let your shoulders fall away from your ears. And notice any place that you're holding tension, whether that's in your thoughts, in your jaw, your shoulders, your hands. And welcome that tension as a signal, as the communication between you and your body. And if it feels right or comfortable, you could ask that tension to soften. As thoughts and judgments and stories come up, as they will throughout our whole time together, acknowledge them and then if it feels right, bring your attention back to the present moment. Bring your attention to anywhere that you feel supported, that you're connecting to a chair, to the ground, maybe to your table. Feeling the sensation of your body meeting a supportive verse. If it feels fun or helpful, you could soften your eyes and imagine roots growing down from any place you are connected. Your roots could be any color or shape that you want them to be. Connecting you to your space, to the earth underneath you. offering you support. Maybe your roots grow down deep or spread out wide. Knowing there's no wrong or right way. And as you feel ready, maybe open your eyes, shimmy and shake, bringing blood flow back through the body 
You're welcome to have your camera on or off for the remainder of this section, whatever supportive to you. And as we think about that theme of being grounded and connected, um, that'll really be the theme throughout our conversation on ecological grief. And I'll acknowledge a slight lack excuse me, a slight lack of expertise and technology. So I'm going to try to share a presentation with you and you can tell me. It's working, Bailey, but you did mute yourself. How about now? There you go. Now we're cooking. Okay, so ecological grief, what brought us together today, that among from what you wrote and shared a lot of other things. And so, oh wait, Mary, was I supposed to move on or was there a pause? No, you're good. The pause is after this, before <laughs> questions. <laughs> oh, thank you. Okay, thank you for your grace and my silliness. Okay. Um, so ecological grief, the role of individuals and communities in mourning nature. Um, and I'll introduce myself a tiny bit. My name is Bailey Fulweiler. I use she, her pronouns. I'm a community social worker in Columbus, Ohio. I study ecological grief and I work with organizations around the intersection of mental health and climate change um, and really climate injustices and how we can support the mental well-being of those in the environmental movement, um, but also how we can use the acknowledgement of the mental health impacts of climate injustices and in our work to communicate um, for policy and advocacy change with decision makers and organizations. So that's a little about, about me. I'm an eco grief nerd. And today I'm going to take a little bit of time to offer a definition of ecological grief. Likely you've heard the phrase name it, detain it. And so having language around the collective experiences we have for mourning nature is really helpful. And I want to offer some of the language um, that researchers and communities have built to connect us in that shared experience. We're going to talk a little bit about um, protective factors, things that help us meaningfully and in really healthy and beautiful ways be with ecological grief um, and integrate it into our work. We're going to talk about the benefits of grieving nature. Uh, I know that sounds silly. Grief doesn't sound like something that's a benefit, um, but there are a lot of health and collective goods that come from the, the practice of mourning nature. So we're going to talk a little bit about uh, what we gain when we don't avoid grief and we um, come together to feel it. And then we're going to consider some of the practices there are for mourning nature. So we might know that we're feeling grief around environmental losses, but we might not know what practices or ways we have to express that or come together as a community express it. So, that's where we're going today. So below you'll see Ashley Consolo and Neville Ellis. Um, they wrote the book Morning Nature, which is a beautiful, uh, really expansive book um, that accumulates a lot of their own research um, and then the research and wisdom of indigenous communities, agricultural communities, um, and folks that for a lot of reasons are deeply connected to nature and most feel the impacts when nature is degraded or um, damaged. And so in the book, they define nature, as, uh, ecological grief, excuse me, as the grief felt in relation to experience or anticipated ecological losses, including the loss of species, ecosystems, and meaningful landscapes due to acute or chronic environmental change. Um, and I would say, if I was to tweak this definition at all, I would say chronic environmental injustices um, and climate change specifically. And you might be familiar with related terms that have been developed to kind of communicate the climate emotions we have in response to these injustices and the changing landscapes. And so one is solastalgia, 
which is the pain experienced when there's a recognition that the place where one resides and the one that and one that is loved is under immediate assault, a form of homesickness one gets when they're still at home. Um, a lot of communities that are experiencing heightened um, pollution and then heightened uh, extreme weather or natural disasters um, relate to this term as seeing a landscape that they're deeply connected to changing in front of their eyes um, and being under assault. And then another term that you'll likely hear a lot is eco-anxiety or climate anxiety, which is the heightened emotional, mental, or somatic distress in response to dangerous changes in the climate system. And so both those terms and eco-anxiety really are sisters. Um, you often hear that depression and anxiety um, are side by side, and I feel the same way about eco-anxiety and eco-grief, is likely you've experienced fluctuating between the two, um, you know, either that heightened sense of arousal caused by the threats of climate injustices, and then that deep sadness and grief afterwards. And I guess one thing I'd love to mention is sometimes we hear these words and we think that we're, they're um, a diagnosis. Um, and something from the mental health world that I want to share is that um, creating the shared language is not to pathologize um, these experiences. These are normal reactions to injustice and um, threats to our survival and threats to the things that we love. And so Creating the shared language just gives us a way to communicate what we're feeling, um, to recognize it, to communicate about it, um, for advocacy and policy to help measure it. Um, but these aren't things that you would diagnose somebody with. They're just experiences um, and emotional signals and words that we're giving so that we can have that connection and community when we talk about how climate injustices are impacting our mental health. And then when we look at the research on ecological grief, um, there's certain characteristics that I think are really helpful for providing us a launching space to better understand our experiences or the experiences that our peers or coworkers or loved ones are having. The first is that ecological grief tends to be very specific. Humans grieve particular losses, whether that's a species, a location, or a landscape that they have an attachment to. And so I think this is important because a lot of times I see that people are distressed about, you know, the damage or harm that's happening in another community. And they might be feeling anxious or aroused by the threats that other communities are facing. But when we're talking about the experience of grief, um, humans really only agree with things that they have an attachment and an understanding of. So while I felt a lot of sadness and fear and concern um, when there was the huge wildfires in Australia, I won't necessarily grieve those losses because I don't have, you know, a relationship in which I've been to or experienced connection to that country and that landscape. And so when we're talking about eco-grief, we're looking at things that are really place-based, something that you have a connection to and that you are relating to in a consistent way. And I think that's helpful because when we're talking about how wide scale environmental damages and climate injustices are, people can feel overwhelmed at like, how can I feel so much for all of this suffering? And really, when we make it local, when we make it specific, and we're looking at what we see, what we feel, what we're connected to, what land we have a history and a relationship with, I think it makes it more manageable because we can have an emotional response to any you know, affront to our values or things that we care about. Um, but that, that grief, that deep sorrow, that deep feeling of loss is typically place-based and specific. Another characteristic that we see in ecological grief is that it's disenfranchised. And I want to make one asterisk to what I've written here, that there are no socially prescribed methods for engaging or acknowledging environmental losses, because that's not historically true. Um, there's lots of indigenous and Inuit and agricultural communities that have practices around environmental losses. But when we're talking about the wide scale pollution, degradation, and the loss of species 
in a region or um, across the globe because the era of climate change and the sinks the sixth um, level of extinction is you know it's new it's at time specific we don't really have practices particularly in western cultures around how we can acknowledge and be with these environmental losses and the losses that we experience are often invalidated by climate change denial and we know that when you are feeling grief or you're trying to mourn and you're connecting with others because grief is a social experience um, mourning is a social and collective activity um, when that's denied by those that say that climate change isn't real or that climate injustice isn't real or it's not as bad as it seems or that's being overhyped up that invalidates our feelings and it prevents us from having that social shared experience of collective mourning that's so therapeutic and beautiful and, you know, it's what rejuvenates us when we experience a loss is that collective experience of mourning. And so just like those um, a few decades ago who weren't acknowledged when they were feeling grief around pet loss, um, and I know pet loss is different than the loss of a species or a landscape, um, but really it's only in the last 30 years that we've even developed practices or cultural norms around acknowledging the loss of a pet and an animal family member. And if there's been so many health benefits from having socially prescribed ways that we acknowledge that loss, that we need to be able to do something similar with environmental losses in which there are social practices and supports to be able to name it, to come together, to experience the loss. Um, and then the last characteristic that we talk a lot about in ecological grief is that it's a complicated grief um, because all humans to some degree contribute to or engage in the culture and the economy that's resulted in climate change. And so as a result, individuals can have feelings of guilt or shame um, that show up when they experience a loss and there can be resistance or denial um, because guilt and shame are such difficult emotions to be with. And of course, there's a huge asterisk in this and that this is mostly true of more privileged cultures and identities. And we know that individuals are not responsible for losses or for the impact of climate change. That's um, a small percentage of industries um, and that humans are just navigating capitalism to the best of our abilities. And as um, BJ shared, we'll need to find alternative ways of living to be able to get out of um, what's happening. We can't buy our way out of climate change and climate grief. But for a lot of humans, we see that people turn away from their grief or resist it, um, which has its own mental health impacts because they feel guilt and shame that they didn't do more or that they drive a car that's fueled by fossil fuels. Um, and really, we know as much as we can help reiterate that individuals are not responsible for climate losses of species or landscapes. Um, but I think the characteristics of ecological grief can be helpful to understand as an individual or as a community because it makes it a launching space for our imaginations and for our creativity and moving forward. And so if we know that it's specific, if we know that it can be disenfranchised, if we know that it can be complicated, then we can be intuitive and intentional. And when we are experiencing grief ourselves or a loved one is experiencing ecological grief, that we have context to be able to support them. We also see from the research that there are different types of ecological grief, which I think are incredibly important. The first one is the one that many will be familiar with, which are physical losses, whether that's a landscape or the extinction of a species. Um, or the degradation or pollution of a particular waterway or area of land. And those physical losses, they're visual, they're potent. Um, you know, I work with a lot of communities um, that are in Appalachia and they've experienced mountaintop removal. And there's this very visual image of what they've lost of a landscape that used to exist and now has been changed or damaged. But it's also important to understand that we can feel grief for anything that we have attachment to. And so there are also cultural losses, whether that's related to 
um, your identity or your profession or cultural knowledge that is lost due to climate injustice and climate change. And so a lot of that research looks at whether that's in indigenous communities, agricultural professionals, those who work with wildlife, um, those who forage the land and who are deeply integrated into the land, those who recreate on the land. We know that there's historical and oral histories that we've passed down and traditions that no longer exist because the landscapes are different whether that's being able to navigate a place by the sound of how wind moves through the mountain, whether that's the loss of a glacier that was a landmark for your community, um, whether that's no longer being able to predict how to respond and how to care for crops as the environment continues to change and the weather continues to change. But we feel this loss of identity, a loss of connection to our practices, our ancestors, our profession, our community um, that all responded to a knowledge and connection to the land. And I think it's really important to honor and name our cultural losses because not every loss from climate change is something that we can visually see, something that we can take a picture of, something that we can paint. And so it's helpful to understand that just because your loss can't be seen doesn't mean that you don't feel grief to it and doesn't mean that it doesn't deserve to be mourned and recognized. Uh, we also feel grief as anticipation. And so a lot of this people in zoology and conservation that I work with uh, will already be experiencing um, the feelings of grief when they see that a species is likely not going to be able to survive the rapid change in climate or habitat that is necessary for the survival of species um, it is being degraded at a rate that it would be hard to protect um, and so we can feel grief and anticipation of a loss that's coming but hasn't arrived yet and i think that's where a lot of us are depending on your location in the world i live in the midwest a lot of our large um, losses of species has already occurred. Um, and so we see less visual representation of climate injustice. And so a lot of my grief is anticipation for my loved ones in other spaces that are now feeling some of those big losses. And so all of that is a ton to hold. And when we think about how we want to engage in climate hope, and climate optimism and how we're going to stay in a movement where we know there will be grief and hardship. Um, we need to have things that keep us safe, things that protect us, things that build us up, things that we can either have for ourselves or share with others so that we're staying connected and well. Um, and one of the best ways we have to stay well when we're experiencing ecological grief is engaging in mourning practices. And we'll talk more about um, why I said there are no socially prescribed <laughs> mourning practices. There are a lot of communities that are coming together to find ways to acknowledge and mourn environmental losses in their areas. So whether it's the present of an existing cultural practice or ritual or one that you're creating, being able to have a practice to mourn socially um, is going to help us be mentally well. When we mourn a grief, um, we, we move through it. You know, every emotion has to be felt or it's going to express itself in other ways or we're going to build narratives in our mind around the emotion that's not being acknowledged and felt. So having these practices is a way to feel the emotion um, to come together as a community um, and strengthen ourselves so that we can continue to do our work. Uh, there are existing coping skills that can be really beautiful for those that are in the front line of climate injustices, those that feel deeply connected to nature or those that are working in the environmental movement. Um, Self-compassion practices and mindfulness practices have been hugely beneficial for those that are experiencing climate related losses because as we shared it can feel complicated um, and we might have feelings of guilt or shame or despair and related to a climate loss and having self-compassion self practices um, not only for ourselves but for others 
uh, can be hugely beneficial to being able to stay healthy and well while we're doing this work together. Uh, mindfulness practices that help us stay connected to the present moment. Um, like I said, likely we fluctuate between eco-anxiety and ecological grief. Anxiety is a fixation often on the future and fear of the future, and grief is often an expression um, where we're feeling connected to the past. And so having mindfulness practices that help us build being in the present moment feeling sensations in our body, being able to give our thinking minds um, an opportunity to check in with how we're doing and feeling on a somatic level or connecting with another person that's right in front of us are hugely beneficial. Having supportive communities is a huge protective factor, um, particularly if you're an active member of a community or you're connected with others that are like-minded. This will prevent the disenfranchisement in which you might be in a household or in a workplace where others are not as connected to the climate movement. Maybe they're not as connected to land. They might be experiencing a disconnection to land and nature. Um, and so they might not be able to understand or recognize the grief or the climate emotions that you're having in response to uh, a loss or to degradation. And so having a like-minded community where um, the way that you feel is honored and understood and shared is a huge benefit. And also having a supportive community can be brought together to have those morning practices. And so there's so many benefits in having that space that you can go to and cultivating, whether it's a few friends or an organization or um, consistently coming to these A to Z impacts of plastic sessions, but knowing that there are people who understand and are gonna be there um, to either hold space for you or have a shared experience with you. The other protective factor that um, excites me to no end is having intergenerational relationships. Uh, we see as we're learning more about the impacts of climate change on mental health that youth are more likely to be experiencing eco-anxiety and fear for their future, Their peers future and the future of the earth, whereas older adults are more likely to be experiencing ecological griefs and feelings of shame or distress about the planet that they're leaving um, or about landscapes that they no longer recognize. And when we bring youth and older adults together, um, whether that's for mental health or for um, taking climate action together, we see a lot of benefits in which older adults feel inspired and hopeful by youth activists and youth activists um, have the opportunity to be supported, seen and heard by older generations that understand the challenges that they're facing. Uh, so I could probably geek out about intergenerational relationships forever, but we have other things to do today. The benefits of morning nature um, is the number one question I get. When I started doing this research in 2018 and 19, uh, the number one response I got from environmental activists is they didn't have the capacity to, to feel everything that was happening for the earth that they were witnessing and that they didn't see what good it would be to feel their climate grief. And what research shows us um, when it's a grief in mourning is that there are huge benefits. Uh, the first benefit is that it prevents that disenfranchisement. So I said name it to tame it. So having language to name the feeling that you're having is huge, uh, but you also have to feel it to heal it. So it's not enough just to name an emotion and then disregard it. Having um, the capacity and the practices to be able to feel your grief is going to be hugely beneficial so that it doesn't end up expressing itself in other ways, which could be depressive symptoms, anxious symptoms, um, isolating yourself, feeling withdrawn, um, leaving the climate movement. We see a lot of people um, who haven't had support or practices to be able to feel their climate grief and anxiety, um, and they've left the climate movement or they're not as active as they could be because they don't have the support um, to be able to do that. So when we mourn nature, it's an acknowledgement of the loss of the connection, um, and it connects us to others in a social way so that we're able to move through the grief and find health and wholeness and rejuvenation in our community to be able to stay active. 
Um, morning nature is also a form of climate action. Public displays of environmental grieving have raised awareness. Um, there's been publications done. It's um, drawn attention to decision makers. It's invited others to participate into work, to find others to do the work with. Um, and so there's huge benefits in collective grieving because it spurs action. And that's part of the healthy movement through climate grief is being able to get to a place where you can meaningfully take action and that others in your community who might be less connected or less aware are able to see the impacts of climate degradation and climate injustices. Um, we also see that healing can come from mourning nature. Um, one of the biggest concerns we see um, in the movement is a disconnection from nature and from land. And so when we grieve nature, we're able to reconnect that relationship and acknowledge um, our connection to land and non-human entities and landscapes. And so it's a really powerful way to reconnect um, and re-strengthen that relationship that might have been damaged, whether that's from you know, our removal, the urbanization of land, um, the damaging of land, but it's a beautiful way to heal that relationship and reconnect from what we've seen in the research. There are a lot of beautiful practices that have been explored in communities that I've worked with and communities all over the world to be able to collectively mourn nature. One of the most common practices I've seen is memorial services, so bringing people together at the site of either um, a damaged landscape um, or the loss of a uh, remaining species. Uh, there have been groups that have created memorial markers, which are both, um, you know, communicating out with others, but also designating the spot, just like you would with a tombstone, um, and then incorporating funeral practices from other cultures, such as candlelight vigils, protests, um, you know, having large collective um, meals together, but taking in other practices we have from our cultures um, to be able to grieve a loss and incorporating that into the climate loss. So memorial services are a beautiful way that I've seen a lot of communities come together to be able to honor a loss. Um, another way that we've seen a lot of activists be able to grieve nature is through works of art, whether that's creating poetry, the memorial markers can be a work of art, musical arrangements, there's been documentaries, um, but just creating visual representations of the loss that you're feeling and then bringing people together to experience that art. A lot of the film festivals um, around climate change and climate injustices have been acts of collective mourning and being able to acknowledge through an art, artistic expression a loss that you've had. We've also seen art galleries and museums be able to hold um, collections and events around climate losses to be able to bring communities together to experience the shared ex um, the shared feelings of loss through art, which I think is really beautiful and powerful. Um, another practice that I've seen recently from communities that's been really beautiful is writing obituaries or op-ed pieces for um, climate loss. Um, there was a community that wrote an obituary for a damaged and polluted um, body of water where they lived. Um, there's been obituaries written for glaciers that have lost their glacier status or mountains that have experienced mountaintop removal. Um, an obituary is a beautiful practice that talks about um, the birth or origin of something, um, the date of the loss of something, and then the life in between. And so there's this beautiful narrative we create where we acknowledge the fullness and the life of something and then share it out. And when you read an obituary, which I know is a little outdated, but when you read an obituary, um, you see that there's been a loss and you call and you check in on your loved one and you see what they need. And there's this social practices that come with reading and recognizing obituary that have been really beautiful in a lot of the communities that I work with. And one of the case studies that I love to show if somebody is looking for you know, an idea to conceptualize ecological grief is this beautiful article written on how to mourn a glacier. It came out in 2019 and it talks about a community in Iceland that came together to do just those things. They had a memorial service for a glacier that lost its status as a glacier. 
and the glacier had a name and it had a history and it came up in children's stories and in the culture and narrative of Iceland. And so they came together to have a memorial service and decision makers and government um, government employees from that space came together to hear activists share their testimonies and their stories about the impact of the glacier, just like a loved one would come up and share about the loss of a, a family member at a funeral. And it was just a really beautiful way that they both rose, raised awareness and honored that grief and community. And then they came together to make decisions about how they could prevent losing another glacier in the future. So it's a beautiful article and I can send it to anyone who wants to read it about, you know, how one community came together to grieve a loss. Um, there will be a resource guide that's sent out that has support groups, climate aware therapist directories and readings about ecological grief. If you're looking for more community connection or information. Um, and we'll also be talking about ways that we want to continue supporting each other after this. So more to come. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Bailey. Um, I just feel hopeful just having received all that information. You know, like you said, it just helps us kind of put everything in perspective. So thank you. All right. So next, we're just going to take a minute um, to transition into um, and, and just give ourselves to, to process. Uh, everything we've just heard, and then to think about maybe if you have any questions or you have any um, want further uh, explanation on something. Um, so we're just going to listen to a song, um, part of a song, um, uh, to give ourselves an opportunity to, to transition. I just wanted to quickly note before I start that we will stop live streaming and recording during this. So um, just wanted to make note of that as we move forward. of the mind trying to find a way to show that I got darkness, I got light, I got everything in between. 